and this is um, we just which is the pointer this is the I can use the screen for advancing but okay okay I probably want to my, well, a good morning everyone um, what I wanted to give you today for it's, we're starting exactly half an hour late okay so that should be 45 minute lecture um, I wanted to go over sort of set some conceptual groundwork uh, for, for the next two weeks. We'll be hearing a lot about different kinds of interactions between the tropics and extratropics. And so there are some concepts, um, some ideas which may underlie them even implicitly. They may not even be stated, but just sort of give you some background um, for those. So the, um, the first one is there are some of the language we use when we're talking about how the extratropics respond to the tropics um, is actually almost subconsciously based in theories of uh, stationary, um, stationary wave theory. So what I mean by stationary wave theory is if you have a, an anomalous source in the tropics, which is stationary, it just sits there, okay, there'll be a, a stationary response, just a time-independent response in mid-latitudes. And that's been very well, well studied. That's relevant on longer time scales. But some of those concepts have been sort of are used even we don't realize it when we're describing uh, intraseasonal uh, or shorter term in, uh, responses of the extratropics to tropical forcing. So it's, it's good to know and to ask us ourselves the question, um, can we use some of these ideas of stationary wave theory? Um, I also want to just uh, re remind us of a topic that may or may, that hopefully will come up, that the tropical forcing can affect not only the, the mean circulation of the extratropics, but it can change or excite different kinds of instabilities in the extratropics, um, in, in particular barotropic instability. I'll just remind, uh, talk about that a little bit. There are many ways in which the tropics actually respond to the extratropics. Um, and some of them, uh, I'm going to give you a couple of examples. OK, actually, one of them in which uh, I actually did some computations for this. And finally, um, there are th situations or ways in which the tropics and extratropics may be more coupled together. Okay, as part of a sort of global oscillation, than is, than is often realized, and um, I'm going to at least mention one of those briefly. So to just try to get you to think about the, the framework for the for the whole two weeks. So, the first topic. The words that I didn't write down here that I want you to think about are Rossby wave source. Okay, you may have heard of them, and it sounds like okay, you have some disturbance here in Rossby waves. Propagate, propagate eastward from that, OK? Um, in, the, in the context of the extratropical response to the tropical forcing, that has kind of a background, a theoretical background, which I just wanted to sort of briefly indicate. Um, so the first slide, and I'm going to show this slide tomorrow again, OK, in a different context. This actually comes from a, a recent paper by Grant Brandstatter in 2014. And the question was exactly, what is the response of the extratropics to tropical heating anomalies that are short-lived? What is the response of those to the same tropical heating anomalies if they were to just st stay there permanently? So what he did was um, he took an atmospheric model, a dry model, so that no moisture, so you can just add heating, specify heating. And he put it, for example, in this set of experiments here on the left column, he just put a heating where that, red, that yellow circle is, a deep heating, um, representing anomalous convection there for, for two days, only two days. It's like a pulse. Okay, put it on, leave it there for two days, and turn it off. And that's days uh, two. Sorry, this is day, day three, day six, and day nine. So this is the, what you're looking at actually is the meridional wind at, in upper levels indicating the, you can see the development and the spread of the Rossby waves, even though at all these times, the heating has already been turned off, okay? So his point was that by the time you get to day nine, if on, in the same panel he were to show the result of the 
of the meridional wind at upper levels um, to a stationary heating source, he would get almost the same pattern. Okay, so tomorrow I'm going to talk about this in a different kind, the same picture in a completely different context. But in this context, this gives us some hope that we can at least apply ideas of stationary wave theory to um, to transient perturbations in the tropics. So the first thing I want to remind you of, and maybe the most important thing, is that in some general sense, the exotropical uh, response to tropical perturbations is usually has a barotropic vertical structure. So um, that's kind of seen very often. And to try to come up with an example, I had to put one together. So what I took was for stationary waves now, I just thought about the El Nino Southern Oscillation. OK? So what I did was I looked at the, um, the response to a warm event of 82, 83. I took the anomaly of the winter, boreal winter mean compared to a 32-year climatology from reanalyses. And I looked at the top panel shows the divergence, OK? Um, tropical divergence just along the equator from here we have longitude on the x-axis and we have pressure level. And um, you can see there is convergence. So negative divergence means convergence, right? The air coming together, as you would expect, for the anomalies in the warm event of El Nino, where you have, you have um, anomalous convection in the east, central and eastern Pacific. And right above the uh, anomalous convergence, there is anomalous divergence. OK, so a reversal from above and below. And if you look at the U-wind anomaly in mid-latitudes for that same period, um, you can see that it's, uh, you can see that the stru vertical structure of it is there's almost no phase shift with height, OK? So it's, we call that, in theory, equivalent barotropic. But it says, well, maybe bar the barotropic, uh, barotropic dynamics has a lot to do with this. Maybe somehow we can relate with barotropic dynamics, we can relate this upper level divergence right to the wind that occurs in mid latitudes. So this is another example um, of the same thing, except I now took the stream function. Um, the what I took was the the seasonal mean stream function and removed the zonal mean to get just the eddies, but so really stationary eddies. And you can see again in the tropics, there's kind of the top panel is. Uh, um, average from 15 south to 15 north, you can see the barotropic structure. And the bottom panel, you can, I'm sorry, you can see the first baroclinic mode. OK, you can see the reversal um, right between lower levels and upper levels between 1,000 millibars and 150 millibars here in the Eastern Pacific. And in the, um, this isn't working too well. You can see the barotropic structure here, right? So this kind of motivates the use of the barotropic, uh, barotropic dynamics. This is the same thing for another warm winter, 97, 98. Um, again, some kind of reversal in the tropics, but a completely equivalent barotropic structure in the extratropics. Um, so this is, uh, again, the notion that the extratropic response can be barotropic. So um, let me go this way. So this is my simple mode of tropical convection. My simple model of trop anomalous tropical convection, as you know, you have divergence below with small vertical velocities, strong rising motion leading to um, negative OLR um, because the, the cloud tops are the ones that are radiating out to space and they're cold. And then um, the upper level winds have a divergence, D, which is positive. So how does this, so how do we relate to this idea of Rusby wave source? How do we relate, how do we represent this tropical motion, this tropical rising motion? Well, scale analysis and some theory will show you that if you look at the thermodynamic equation, the important terms are uh, this theta here is the potential temperature. So I'm just kind of writing the second law of thermodynamics. It just basically says vertical advection of theta w d theta dp is balanced by tropical heating. Um, since now let's get this straight, theta has got to potential temperature has to increase with height, right? So d theta dp has got to be negative, 
in the mean, and omega is negative. So d theta dp, this is a, a negative term here. So that's basically saying negative omega is, is definitely is strongly related in the seasonal mean to positive heating. Okay, so again, so that's kind of that absurd. That's that picture. So the trop a strong rising motion leads to large-scale divergence. And let me get go a little bit faster. So now I write down the barotropic vorticity equation. Okay, and um, it's just it's just the advection of, of absolute vorticity, which is relative vorticity plus plus the uh, Coriolis parameter. And then this, there's this term on the right. Um, this is an approximate version of the vorticity equation. Okay, which is minus the absolute divergence. Uh, vorticity times the divergence plus some kind of friction. And that's called S, and that's called the Rossby wave source. Now, right away, we have a problem in terms of thinking about the extratropical response to tropical anomalies, particularly when you have tropical easterlies. Because stationary wave theory, um, and I'm not going to actually go, go through that, but it's, there are several different ways you can look at it. Stationary wave theory says that if you have a, a source in easterlies in the tropics, it won't, in the time mean, affect the exotropics. Okay, so that zero wind line, right? The, the easterlies in the tropics prevent its influence from propagating to the extratropics. But that's, that's where the heating source is, in fact. The heating source, the source of divergence here which just comes from the heating and the, the rising motion, is in fact very often in easterlies. So what is going on here? That's a paradox. And this is what um, the term, this is the paper where I think the term Rossby wave source comes from, Sardis, Mook, and Hoskins. What they pointed out is that, yes, this is true in this equation, but the pro um, skip this one. The problem is that before I had the total wind here, Okay, in fact, if you want to use the barotropic model and the barotropic vorticity equation, you can only solve for the rotational component of the wind. Just to remind you, the rotational component of the wind is the part, the component of the wind that is zero divergence. So if you want to use the barotropic vorticity equation, there's another term that should appear that where you have the divergent component of the wind as part of the advection. That now will appear on the right side as a source. The reason I say that is this is a nice prescription. This equation, this equation right here is a nice prescription because for actually solving it with a barotropic vorticity equation, if you have some friction and you can specify, you can specify the divergence from the tropics as fixed, and you can specify the divergent component of the wind, okay, the component of the wind that actually has the divergence from the tropics, then this is an, then that you can solve this equation um, because the only variable is the stream function, right? The stream function will give you the relative vorticity, and that plus F will give you the absolute vorticity, and so, and the stream function will give you the advection, right, the, the uh, rotational winds. So you have a closed system that you can solve. So they pointed out that specifying the, the Rossby wave source, you really need to keep both of these terms into account, including advection by the divergent wind, which you have to specify. Um, and that's actually just in words. So there's a new source. This is traditional source. Uh, sorry, the traditional source is just the divergent times the vorticity. Now there's a new source, advection by the, the divergent flow. And just to give you an example, I have to go a little faster. These are contours of absolute vorticity, and that's the traditional Rossby wave source. Do, do, di they're specifying a divergence at upper levels in the Western Pacific here in this experiment. And so the divergence is right here, and the traditional Rossby wave source would be right here. And it, they don't show, but this is pretty much in the region of easterlies. The new Rossby wave source, as, this mo as they run the barotropic model, here's the divergent wind, okay? And there's a, in the northern hemisphere, there's a strong gradient of, of absolute vorticity. <coughs> the divergent wind advects the absolute vorticity northwards, okay? And that pulls the Rossby wave source into regions of westerlies. It pulls it out of the deep tropics. So this paper was a, a uh, I think, 
just in terms of simple concepts, an important sends an important message that you can think of barotropic, a barotropic model giving a, a stationary wave response in mid-latitudes, but you have to have the correct Rossby wave source. Okay, so that's, that's, one, um, that's one thing just to keep in mind. The second topic I want to move on to quickly is the change in mid-latitude instability due to tropical forcing. Um, so um, this is this paper by Simmons, Wallace, and Branstetter in 1983. And they talk, talked about the role, of, the role of mid-latitude barotropic instability. We're all familiar with baroclinic instability, storm tracks, you know, rapidly developing disturbances, right, that, that occur all around the world, especially mid-latitudes. Barotropic instability is less, um, is less often discussed. They, basic, they used basic states, um, which, were, which had a lot of a, a longitudinal and latitudinal variation. And they were able to find, um, for a chronological f a flow, just using the barotropic model, they were able to find low frequency fluctuations, which derived their energy from the barotropic instability. They had an e-folding, they had periods of about 45, and also there were shorter periods, and e-folding times, growth rates or leading to e-folding increased in about seven days. It's kind of slow compared to typical barotropic instabilities. But as you'll see in a second, these, in, these barotropic instabilities have a lot of geographical variation. And locally, in space and time, they can uh, grow very rapidly. And this mode may play a big role, may be excited by tropical forcing, in particular the Madden-Julian oscillation, which we'll hear a lot about later. So I just wanted to sh just run through this quickly. So this was the most unstable mode, OK? Um, and basically what happens, it's an oscillating mode that propagates and grows. So it's not just the patterns that it goes through or a whole sequence of patterns here, starting from the top left, top right, middle left, middle right, bottom left, bottom right. OK, um, that's sort of half a period of its growth. So the overall energy only has an e-folding time of about 6.8 days. But there are periods in their regions you can find where, you know, right here, where it's growing from this panel to this panel very quickly. OK. So this mode is kind of, uh, there's a lot of structure going on in this mode. And what, are they, what they pointed out was, and I know I'm jumping ahead a little bit. We hear a lot more about the Madden-Julian oscillation, which is related to um, convection in the tropics that move slowly through the Western Pacific. And in different phases of that oscillation, these are the mid-latitude responses and stream function. So all I want you to get out of this picture is that, for example, this top right panel here, OK, um, which shows one of the, the maps that I just showed you on the previous page, has something in common um, with this response of the MJO in one phase. In fact, there, um, there's some, some of the patterns are, some of the features look similar. And also, this map looks much like the negative of this map. OK? You can see a positive, positive, and negative here, and negative, and negative, and positive there. So this paper goes through this in a lot more detail. The point is, the response to the Madden-Julian oscillation may involve um, both, actually, it may involve several modes. This is the longest period. The, the, the mode that takes the longest to repeat, 45 days. And then there's another mode, um, w w which is actually, um, no, this is a, it's a, a similar picture. I don't want to go through all the panels in detail. But again, the take home message is simply that this barotropic instability can be excited by tropical forcing, OK? But it's, it's an intrinsically uh, mid latitude phenomenon. OK, and, and that really can't, we can't forget about that. So let me very s quickly switch gears to possible ways in which, the or a possible way in which the tropics may uh, respond to mid-latitudes. Um, so there's actually been a lot of this in the literature. Um, this is taken from a paper by Knippertz in 2007, OK? Um, and it's basically upper-level troughs at low, at low latitudes, 
So basically disturbances from middle latitudes, troughs that descend into the tropics, okay, and stimulate tropical convection. So this is an actual pa a satellite picture. Um, okay, so what, this is on an isentropic level, a level of constant potential temperature. So if the flow is, um, is basically governed by adiabatic dynamics, it should, should stay on the surface. Okay, um, and this is close to the 200 millibars in the tropics. So basically what you have are the streamlines of the flow as on the surface, okay, coming in from here and, and here's 30 north, here's the tropics, here's 30 north, you can see the streamlines coming down in. This is actually, if you're into this kind of thing, it's, it's, it looks like it's related to an anticyclonic Rusby wave break, but that's not necessary to know that. The dashed lines are the isotacks, how strong the winds are. And you can see this sort of trough coming, descending into mid, into mid latitudes. And you can see this is the, the cloud picture, okay? This is actually the picture on which all these lines are superimposed is, is a satellite pic, uh, infrared image of a tropical plume, okay? Going, coming out from the tropics here into the exotropics. So it's, it's a nice sort of, the smoking gun of extra tropics affecting tropical <laughs> convection, okay? So, um, and there are lots of examples of this, pictures like this you can find in the literature. Another example, which I don't have a picture of, is cold air outbreak in northern winter over Siberia, okay, extending all the way into the um, uh, equatorial Pacific, all right, in the middle of the Pacific, and leading to convection. So I thought I would do some diagnosis um, to, to represent that. And, and I'm going to show you pictures that appear in a paper um, that we've submitted with Highland as a co-author and Christine and I to um, Highland as a lead author <laughs> to views of geophysics. Um, the idea here is to do something really simple. So let's concentrate, I, I know some of you are interested in storm tracks, let's concentrate on fields which vary with time scales of less than 10 days. So could be related or should be related in mid-latitudes to, 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 to the storms. So if you just concentrate on those fields and you look at the momentum flux, okay, and you average it over a whole winter and then many winters, um, and this is nothing new, but people know this, but somehow it's never commented on. What you find in the, in the, in the subtropics, uh, sorry, the southern hemisphere is that the, the momentum flux is less than zero, okay, everywhere. And um, it turns out, according to wave theory, that will, relates to equator with propagation of waves. The same thing in the northern hemisphere, except now the momentum flux is, is greater than zero, okay. Um, so it's in both cases, it's poleward. Uh, in both hemispheres, the momentum flux is poleward. But again, there's some theory that relates a positive momentum flux to equator propagation of station, or pro sorry, equator propagation of velocity waves. The thing I'm, having said all those words, the thing I want to point out is look how, how far this momentum flux extends into the, extra, into the tropics. In the southern hemisphere, it's what? It's, very well behaved. It stays out of the tropics, right? 26 south is the tropics. In the northern hemisphere, it's not well behaved at all. It incurs all the way down to, what is that, 10 north, okay? So that already gives you a hint that, that the equator propagation of mid-latitude kinds of events, which are very baroclinic in nature, can have an effect on the tropics. So to I sort of scratched my head to come up with a way of doing that. So what I did was the following, and I'm summarizing a lot of work. You can estimate the diabatic heating from modern reanalyses, and we can talk about that later, okay, at, at length, how to do that. Um, it's just an estimate. And just do some uh, temporal filtering, okay, to make sure that it's, it, that it's a nice, smooth, tropical heating that you're getting. So that you can get day by day at every grid point, and you can get the product of these high frequency momentum fluxes day by day at every grid point, okay? And you can just do, do the covariance of those two. The point being, is there, are there places where equatorward 
propagation of velocity uh, of waves indicated by positive event influx are correlated with the, with the tropical heating. So you do that for winter. You do that, then average it together. And of course, this is a, a satellite projection. That's the middle of the Pacific there. And you can see uh, nothing. OK? Climatologically, there's not anything. But that's climatologically. In certain winters, you can find, for example, the winter of 1989 and 1990, you can find a strong positive covariance where a pole, sorry, equatorward propagation of Rossby waves is related, strongly uh, covariating with, with heat, diabetic heating. OK? So for that season, you really did get a strong effect of the extra tropics on the tropics. And then to prove this, that this is not, to actually show you how this works, I picked one day uh, in a different year just for variety. What you see on the left panel in the contours is just the meridional wind, the high pass meridional wind, OK? And the, the colors are tropical heating. And you can see kind of, I indicated just by adding an arrow here, you can see kind of a wave train propagating into the, from the exotropics into the tropics. That's the associated positive momentum flux. And in the eastern, here in the eastern tropical Pacific, you get, you get uh, heating, OK, where you normally don't get. OK? So this is kind of another, this is similar to the photograph, sort of a kind of a smoking gun of, extra, of uh, extratropical incursions into the tropics related to tropical heating. OK, so that's something I hope we'll discuss more and hear more about um, and think more about in the next two weeks. Um, so how, how much, how am I doing time-wise? I'm going to probably, use, I just have one more. So OK, I probably won't, but OK. So, so um, as well, OK, the one thing I should mention are these estimates of, of diabetic heating. It's not so easy to get diabetic heating, right? Because you don't analyze it. You don't measure it directly. So this diabetic heating was obtained if you would just write down the thermodynamic equation, the time rate of change of potential temperature or entropy is related to diabetic heating. And with modern reanalyses, you have, um, you have enough resolution in time and in space and good enough um, data that you can basically estimate that as residual. Okay, So just re remember, in reanalyses, what you're doing is every six hours, you're getting the best possible state of the atmosphere that's dynamically consistent but influenced strongly by observations. Right? So, you're going from one state to the next state to the next state. And um, never mind what the model is, the final reanalysis, if, it, if, if it's a good model, OK, and a good data simulation system, should be realistic. So I'm just counting on that to back out the diabetic heating as, as, as one of the terms in the budget. OK? And the reason I'm mentioning that is it's particularly, seems to be particularly uh, related to tropical convection in the 700 to 300 millibar um, range. OK, the last, so, OK, so we have the, we now hopefully have the idea that the tropics can be influenced by the extra tropics. So now I want to present something that's old, but sort of weird. OK, <laughs> that's the way to describe it. It's a paper I wrote with Richard Lindzen in 2000. So are these coupled? Or are they sometimes coupled, or are they always coupled? OK. So this is the idea. OK, this is, um, people still ask me about this, but anyway. So if you think of really simple theoretical studies of baroclinic instability on a sphere, OK, sorry, not simple, realistic baroclinic instability on a sphere, right? Really good models, correct spherical geometry. They'll indicate that, that zonal wave numbers 8 to 15, sort of synoptic waves, are the most unstable. Um, these are the ones that we see every day. And they, these waves saturate relatively quickly. They grow, and they mature, and they decay in 10, 15 days. But there are um, 
more slowly growing longer waves. Longer waves are actually, um, I think, planetary waves, wave numbers one, two, and three. They are baroclinically unstable, okay? They grow more slowly. They're able to achieve higher amplitudes, particularly in this upper troposphere and stratosphere, okay? So um, the ancient theoretical literature, those were called green modes. And the first paper I ever published, the title was Long Wave Baroclinic Instability on the Sphere. And it was exactly about these. Okay. Um, and they were already just talked about in the 70s. So, okay, so that's one thing to keep in mind. So zonal wave number one, which is a planetary wave, can still be part of a baroclinic instability. Um, now, for some theoretical reasons, you can expect the phase speed of the wave, which, if let me remind you, it's related to the frequency divided by the dimensional wave number. Um, to be in this range. If you believe that if you buy this or you just blink and say, okay, I'll swallow that, then it turns out there's something very interesting that happens. If you take phase speeds in the range of 1 to 10 meters a second and you specify that the zonal wave number is, the zonal wave number is um, uh, m equals 1, um, sorry, and that's, you confirm, there, there's a mapping, this equation's wrong. There's a mapping between the dimensional wave number k and the zonal wave number, okay? But if you take zonal wave number one, find out what the correct k is depending on the latitude, and evaluate this range of phase speeds, you, f you find that the range of frequencies is almost exactly the range of frequencies that are in the madden julian oscillation. That's pretty, is that a, co that's a could, could be a coincidence, right? Um, because in one case, I'm talking about some theoretical long wave baroclinic instability. In the other case, we're talking about a well known tropical, um, a well known tropical phenomenon, um, which we're going to hear a lot more about. Um, so the idea was the following the idea was to study the coherence. So we're, we're going to concentrate on eastward propagating waves because the mad. Julian propagates eastward, and these baroclinic instabilities propagate eastward. Um, and we're going to look at the zonal wind field, and we're going to just see how coherent they are um, between different latitudes and levels. So the idea was let's concentrate on planetary waves, just wave number one or wave number two. And there are some theory you can use, which I won't bore you with, that allows you to isolate eastward propagating waves. Okay. So we're looking at a real subset of fluctuations. They propagate eastward. They have planetary waves one or maybe two. And they have these frequencies which are in the range of the Madden-Julian oscillation, all right? They also happen, happen to have a phase speeds which are of relevance for baroclitic instabilities. So let me remind you what the coherence means. It's always uh, something that's easy to forget. So we're going to be looking at two time series, okay, which fluctuate, okay. And I'm not going to be looking at a single frequency. I'm going to be looking at a range of frequencies. And these two time series, which will be displaced from each other, um, for each frequency, so the question is, for these two time series, will the phase, uh, if you th just think of one frequency, you know, have a sine wave at one, one latitude and a sine wave at another latitude, there'll be a phase relationship, right? Is that phase relationship um, robust if I just move the frequency slightly? Okay? So, is there a re so basically, you can think of two fluctuating series which have a fairly robust phase relationship with each other. Okay? That's what the coherence me measures. And it's supposed to be an indication of some physical connection. That's the idea. So, the only picture I'm, oh, I can't do it this way. The only picture I'm going to show you. Um, from the paper, because they're all similar, so this is Linzen, Strauss and Linzen in 2000, is this funny picture. So this is the, 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 the coherence here, OK, between basically this, this Madden-Julian oscillation range of frequencies um, for wave number one between the base point here at 32 north and 300. And you can obviously tell that's the base point, because that's where this coherence is, comes up to one. Obviously, the coherence is one of every point with respect to itself, OK? And all other, the same time series, the same filtering by the different latitudes and different levels. 
and um, you find that there's something going on, there's some connection between eastward propagating waves at high, lati high latitudes, or right, a co uh, coherence squared of about point, greater than 0.4. But then you get this bullseye at about t uh, 12 north of a coherence of point, point 0.7, kind of like half the variance in these two time series is, is related to each other, OK? That coherence is so high compared to what you expect that for one solid month, I was convinced I had a coding bug. <laughs> OK, and I, so I spent a month checking every, the code every way, which way I could, and there was no coding bug, OK? So this is kind of remarkable. This says that, um, th I'm sorry, this was taken over an extended winter period for 39 years, OK? That's, so it's mostly boreal winter, but it's really an extended winter. October through March. So what this says is that fluctuations, which might be related to the jet instability uh, it, here in, 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 in the upper troposphere, OK, because the, remember, the jet, the zonal mean jet is around 30 something, 32 north, are strongly coherent with fluctuations, which may very well be in, in the U wind, OK? And I pick the U wind because. It, 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 it sort of captures both what's going on in the mid-latitudes and it's important for the MJO, the upper level U wind. Remember my picture of tropical convection. So you can see that th these two are very strongly coherent. Now, the interesting thing is the first thing you should, we thought of, well, oh, that's just the mid-latitudes responding to the MJO, OK? Um, or it could be the MJO responding to middle latitudes. So what we did was the exact same thing, but we tried to put a time lag between the tropics and the extra tropics. And it turns out the best result, the strongest coherence, is at time lag zero. And if you change it five days either ways, it doesn't matter very much. So this would, on face value, it's, um, we don't really totally understand this, but on face value, it suggests that there are ways in which the tropics and extratropics are globally coupled. And um, I don't know if we're going to be hearing about it the next two weeks. There are instability models, OK, of, of, uh, which take into account heating, basically, theories of global instability, where you can get modes which have both tropical and extratropical um, disturbances growing with all the physics in them. Um, at the same time. So this is something we also ought not to totally forget. Um, OK, so I have 10 minutes. I want to just, again, we uh, just quickly, oh, I have a conclusion slide. OK. So clearly, if we think about the, just to conclude, and I want to be happy to take questions, if we can think about a mid-latitude response to tropical forcing, um, always in the back of your mind when you're thinking about that, think, is this something that you can relate to stationary waves? Or is this something totally, are, are the middle latitudes responding um, in, in a way which is new, because the, the forcing is transient? OK? And we're going to be talking about that a lot, especially um, with the MJO. Um, we also ought to think that tropical forcing can affect mid latitudes in a more subtle way, which is that it can excite mid latitude but it will change the storm tracks. We know that. I haven't actually mentioned that. The tropical instability, you know, tropical forcing will, will alter the mid latitude storm tracks. It's baroclinic instability. But in a more subtle way, it may also excite, it may excite mid latitude barotropic instabilities. OK? So that's always something to keep in mind. I've tried to show you one diagnosis or one way in which the exotropical disturbances can actually lead to tropical heating. There are probably more than I've covered. Um, I know that people are interested in, in this incursion of, of these uh, rusty waves into the tropics uh, to quite an extent these days. And finally, I, we should keep in mind that there are these bits and pieces of evidence floating around that the tropics and extra tropics are not, you can't think of them as separated by a wall, OK? That's actually also true, I think, for the troposphere and stratosphere. We tend to think of tropical meteorology and exotropical, OK? And in some cases, this is not a good idea to think of them as totally separate. 
Okay, so um, I'm happy to take questions and discussion, including those from the, the directors. <laughs>